Hi everyone and um, welcome to the chat loop. My name is Bella Fogan, I'm the Artist Development Coordinator here and I'm so delighted to have you sure, with us today for uh, Panic in Conversation and uh, just a bit about Panic. Panic is an artist steered programme which uses talks and sharing to critically engage with the entire movements of the axis of power. Aidan Mosby is an artist, curator, writer and cultural access consultant who explores civic and personal well-being and climate change. Jim Crawshaw is an independent curator and disability activist and is one of the founders of Disrupt, which is a collective of disabled artists in Leeds. And Aidan and Jim are going to be talking together, drawing on their experiences and discussing approaches to cultural strategies to instigate change and enable equity and access. Many thanks to Anna Smith, who will be interrupting this conversation in British Sign Language, and a recorded version of this um, event will be available to watch on YouTube as well later on. So just a bit about the format, Aidan and Jill are going to speak for roughly 45 minutes, and then we'll have a 10 minute break and then we'll come back for a Q&A. So the Q&A is going to be from people that we have here in the room, but also online. So if you're joining us on YouTube, please use the Q&A function. And that's enough from me, and I'll hand over to Dylan Nathan. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So we thought that it would be useful just to give you a bit of context about how we ended up where we are. Um, so I'm Mosby, I'm an artist and curator, um, working mostly with climate change and well-being, and looking at external physical weather and the internal cycle of emotional weather. And that's mostly through multi-format artworks, so an artwork which might have several iterations, it might be a performance, and an installation, and a film, for example. And I make art not as an end in itself, but as, most likely as a, as a beginning. I'm interested in the conversations which stem from that art and, ha and how those conversations can bring about positive social change. Um, I wasn't born with a disability, I acquired it, and I think that gives me a different perspective on how I experience the cultural world from that context of, of identifying as a disabled neurodivergent artist and curator as opposed to like kind of a, a more normative neurotypical experience of my early life. Um, and so engaging in the, or becoming an artist was, and having had a background in other, in other careers, both as an environmentalist as a, and as a therapist, Coming into the art world was a bit of a kind of, I, I came with different eyes and some of the things that I saw was like, I couldn't believe that they, that they existed. And then also and there was a lot of qualification that I didn't understand, I haven't been to art college, I don't, you know, I don't have that peer group. And the art world is an extremely qualified place and it's an extremely privileged place. And not having been through that system, partly it's a blessing and partly it's a bit of a, a curse as well, or initially it was, and now I'm quite happy that I haven't been, um, because I'm pleased with that perspective. And then also there was the issue about when I became, when I began to identify as disabled, it's like also that it tied up with having a, becoming, trying to identify as an artist, and then truly find, like finding and coming across disability arts was kind of like, oh, right, yeah. So this is kind of what speaks to me. And it, I found it like a, an accepting place somewhere where I can have to explain myself and somewhere where it was, yeah, we were speaking a common language, but also I was still existing and trying to operate within a normative experience of the art world. So largely, um, 
my experience is it's kind of binary between um, kind of existing as a disabled artist in a disabled context, showing work around disability, and then showing work in a normative context, not necessarily about disability, and how your view, how your work is viewed differently depending on those, on those contexts. And also about like a cultural value around, around how disabled people, but also disabled artists, and how that's, how that's affected within the kind of norm of art world. And, and then, yeah, and then trying to navigate away Within within this within this world, and then because finding that initially as a disabled person, it was like kind of set up to fail because that's what disabled people there we we don't complete we can't do work that's very good and you know and we won't deliver and I found that there was a lot of the constructs in the art world was set up to reinforce that and actually and then I. I had an experience where I went to Dundee Contemporary Arts and I had a residency there. It was like, well, how can we enable you to do the job to the best of your ability? And I'll come back and talk about that experience probably more in the conversation with Jill. And it's like, oh, right, so it doesn't have to be like that. You can actually be kind of empowered to, to do the best that you can and make the best work that you can, be the best artist that you can. And that was a real like shift for me. And I think like now, I know that the conversation has changed around access and what we can ask for. But back then, in, in the you know 2010, it was um, it was difficult. The, the same conversations weren't around. So if you wanted like a new day, it was like whoa, what's that? Certainly not getting paid for it, you know. And then kind of the um, and how this has become more and more into like the language and the negotiations that that we can have about about work. And then changing, wanting to become more of a kind of a cultural leader, but not being, not knowing how to do that, and then also not being able to be in an institution and being a freelancer, and the ability to have that kind of that finding your voice and being able to exert your agency without being the difficult one, and all that kind of negative stuff that that can bring, and all the kind of precar extra precarity and emotional labour that that can bring. And then going through some more the kind of, so I went and did an MA in curating and like disability wasn't discussed within that MA unless I brought it up. And then, and now doing a, like a PhD and finding myself doing a PhD, which is a scientific construct, but actually coming from a practice-based artistic, disabled neurodivergent kind of context is thrown on that one into the mix and yeah so that's just a, a brief kind of sketch of where I am and hand over to Jill now. No thank you, thank you. Yeah there's a couple of things I thought what that when you said that, that, that really resonates with me as well. Um, yeah yeah so I'm Jill based here in Leeds. Um, I'm a curator, I always feel slightly uneasy saying that, I'm a curator um, I write and research stuff as well. My focus is on disabled people, disabled people's lives, disability issues. I'm a disabled person. Um, I work with disabled artists, not entirely, but you know, I again work a lot with disabled artists, and I'm interested in disabled artists getting the recognition that they deserve. Um, and as yeah, as Bella said, recently in Leeds we've set up. Uh, a collective of disabled artists that's called Disrupt. Maybe that'll come up a bit later. Um, yeah, just to say a bit about how, how I got here. I, I mean, you know, my life and career has not been in the arts. Um, I donkeys years ago, blind, I did a degree in textile design, that's what brought me to Leeds. Um, but then I've had a career that's been in social care, uh, local authority quality as a disability quality officer, and in the third sector, a health and wellbeing network. So that's what I've worked at. Um, so yes, you know, certainly, yeah, I'm, I'm not being a curator. Up until quite recently, um, and I'll finish this bit with that story about what brought me into curating, I suppose. Um, 
I've worked it, I've always been interested in the arts and I've always been engaged with the arts. And again, going back, you know, I've, I've been involved in the disabled people's movement, particularly in the late 80s and through the 90s. And so, at that time particularly, the disabled people's movement and the disability arts movement in the UK were just really absolutely very closely linked. The disability arts movement then was by and large a political movement. It was disability arts was art made by disabled artists that reflected their experiences of living in a disabled society. That's what disability arts was. You know, different, a bit different than disabled artists who might be making art about whatever, which of course many of them were doing. So I'd had that experience in the movement. I've been involved in the Disabled People's Direct Action Network for a long time. Um, I was a work organiser for that, uh, which was also called DAM for short. Now, if people might, might not remember, depending on your age, well, that was the group of disabled people that used to handcuff and chain themselves to buses and trains and stop traffic and that sort of thing. So, yeah, very much about direct action. So, yeah, that, that's my background. I wasn't born a disabled person either. I became disabled while I was at university. But by that time, you know, then my identity, that sort of really solidified my identity as a disabled person. So when I got Return to disability arts, I suppose, um, about seven years ago, I think, then, you know, my identity as a disabled person was certainly very well established. Um, so, yes, as I say, you know, I've, I've done, um, organised a few exhibitions and events and little things, things like that, that really centred disabled people and disabled people's experiences. Um, I'm going to go back to the, um, you know, tell you, tell you the little tale about what got me into curating the, um, that was in 2014 here in Leeds, when Grace and Perry's exhibition of tapestries, which was called The Vanity of Small Differences, was going to be shown in Leeds. I found out about that. I thought, yes, I'm interested in textiles. I found my place in Perry. I might like to volunteer for that. So I went to a session. Um, for potential volunteers, where I found out that right at the end of the session, oh, oh, by the way, actually, some of the tapestries are going to be up a small flight of stairs, so they won't be accessible to everybody. And this was in an old, old, old house in Leeds. So yeah, there were issues around making it accessible, but you know, the question arose is why put something that was going to appeal to a lot of people in, in a place that wasn't fully accessible. So, you know, my heart sank, I raised an objection, but thought, what can be done? It's all too late, and I'm, you know, there's only a couple of months to go now before the exhibition happens. What can be done? Did a few tweets, knowing it would make no difference whatsoever, wrote a letter of complaint to the head of museums, knowing that would make no difference whatsoever. It didn't, we got into a bit of a stat. Um, <laughs> about it. um, yeah, so it's like, oh, right, yeah, this is going nowhere, it's not going to change anything. What can we do? You know, having been involved in direct action, thinking I really don't want to stage a picket outside the place again. You know, that was that was me from years ago. I don't want to do that anymore. And instead, though, I had the idea of let's put on a counter exhibition of work by disabled artists that's textile based work, so that related to the tapestries, um, and let make sure that that exhibition opens on the same date as the Grace and Perry exhibition opens. So let's try and, you know, pull some of the attention, attention I had on. Make a point, have a protest, but have a protest that was also maybe something, you know, creative or positive. But um, at first, you know, there was very little time, and my thinking was, look, it, it just, this, is, this is sound terrible, this will sound terrible. Well, it doesn't matter what the arms like, it doesn't matter. We just need to get on the other wall. Oh, it turned out through various people's support. I mean, I used curator's space. People may well know about curator's space, and that was fantastic and made a massive difference. Um, and, you know, have the support of Inkwell and Union 105, which is at these street arts for venues. But yes, we're able to reach out to artists across Yorkshire. That was the boundary I set um, for practicality, really. 
and put on an exhibition in two venues that did open on the same day as the Grace and Perry exhibition. And was, you know, a fantastic exhibition with really interesting work by artists using textiles in all sorts of imaginative and innovative ways. Um, and, you know, loads of people came and loads of people liked it. Um, so I won't get into, you know, that, but clearly there was an appetite to see the work, to see work by disabled artists in Leeds. Um, but we're talking about change and whether it made any difference, I suppose. Um, and it's, it's hard to think that, you know, just doing a one-off event or project can really make much difference to things. Um, at the time, though, it, it was quite nice. Whenever the Yorkshire Post or the Evening Post did a spread about the Grace and Perry exhibition, at the end of it, it said, oh, and by the way, there's this other exhibition by disabled artists that's happening at the same time as a protest, so that was quite nice. Um, and actually, it made a practical difference at the time because a lot of people within the council were saying, yeah, it's not right what we're doing this, it shouldn't be, it's not right, we've got to do something about it. And they put in some sort of um, stair lift that went up these final steps. And I'm not saying that would suit everybody, but it did mean that some people who couldn't get up there were able to get up there. So that was like a really, really practical result. Um, and then I think, you know, well, the legacy of that has been more work being shown by disabled artists in Leeds and that people sort of starting to think about who disabled artists are and what their work is. So, you know, it's affected some change within, outside, yeah. I think it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it was, you know, a good thing to do. I mean, that reminds me of the, um, the Jeremy Della <laughs> monument in uh, in Manchester and how I just thinking about like how we how we think about access and how we think about inclusion and who is who's designing and who it's for and I'm very much interested in in public space now we're in a city with not very much public space we're in a city with like a lot of space that looks public but actually it's all owned by private corporations and there's quite a lot, you know, just even close to here there's the little signs that say this is not a public space. And it's like, and, and public spaces are designed, you know, so people don't linger, so that they aren't accessible, so that they are acoustically, you know, insensitive and we want people to move through them. And I'm just thinking about like how the design of our public space transfers to public buildings. And, you know, we were having a, a conversation be, just before this, and I think when we think about disability and we think about access, the, um, the easy, quick win is let's put a ramp in, and let's put a, a lift in, and then that's solved. But I don't think it's as easy as that. I think, like for me, it's not necessarily about physical access, it's about, it's much more about psychological access. And then when I'm in the, um, and I guess as we're in a cultural institution organization, and then I'm also thinking about how can I access, why am I here? And how can I, what I come to see and how can I access that to the, to the best kind of. So it is, it's about like, so for me it makes a difference that that is actually a door, not a wall, even though it looks very much like a wall, it's actually a door. So that makes me, psychologically, that makes me a little bit more kind of, hypersensitive so I couldn't sit where Jill is sitting for example and then I think about you know about my how we I guess if it was like about computers or whatever we'd be thinking about the user experience and it's like how you know how is how do we hang out what makes it accessible why should it be accessible um, you know is it about big letters and, and no, no curly fonts and um, things like that was it you know, and then how much, how nuanced do we go? Is it about like the acoustics that we think about? Is it about like the brightness? And and I also am aware that we can't make everything accessible for everybody all the time. I mean, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are a few things, loads of things to say there, aren't there? I mean, it's like, you know, people, people often say, 
Simple to what you said, Aidan. You know, the access isn't all about, it isn't just about ramps and lifts, but ramps and lifts is a really important part of it. And a lot of what you're talking about as well is about the built environment, how that affects people, how it's more accessible, not just for people with mobility impairment. Also, I would say, you know, I've heard this a few times recently when people say, oh, ramps and lifts, that's an easy answer, that's an easy solution to it. Well, it isn't, it isn't, is it? Because otherwise, we'd be seeing big lifts and ramps all over the place and red mentions, and we don't. So it isn't easy at all. It doesn't seem to be easy. It's not happening fast enough or in other places. And there are some cost issues to that as well. But, I mean, I was just saying to somebody recently, what I, what I like about... I don't know whether you call it the disabled people's group, group I don't know whether that's the right word, but what I like about sort of the discussions around disability and access now, more than they were in the past, is that it's much more about people's relationships with each other and how people are treated um, and care. You might want to say something a bit more about care. Um, but yeah, that's much more part of the picture is, yeah, being welcoming, being kind, being respectful are all really, really, really important elements of making things more accessible and inclusive. And I, think so, so, I think some of it is just about, you know, we use the term access and equality and stuff like that, but I think some of it is just about good hosting yeah. and about being a good host yeah. and about making somebody welcome. And, you know, if someone comes to your house, you know, it's like you welcome them in, you, have you got everything, you want to drink, you want, you know, and it's like, take a seat. And, and, you know, it's just an extension of that. I know it's different and comes with, you know, you've got different responsibilities. But essentially, it's just about good hosting and making sure that people can experience where you are in a, you know, in an appropriate way. Yes. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And getting around that big thing, isn't it, is giving people time, giving people space, giving people options, being flexible, all those sorts of things are all part of the picture. But also, I mean, I'm interested in, oh, I'm interested in access, not as, you know, I mean, obviously we'll get on to talking about the pandemic, because I don't think like we can avoid talking about it. But I think, you know, I'm interested in access from home to home, and that experience, so it's like, I like, you know, if I'm going somewhere new, um, possibly I like a little photo journey on the web, and so I can see, oh, I've got to get off at that train station, and then I see that telephone box, and then I turn right, and then there's a bridge, and I cross the bridge, and then there's that pub. You know, and it's it's really simple to, to do that, and you only have to do it once from the station, and once from the bus station, and, you know, once from the car park. It's like, it's not something that costs an awful lot. People think about access, and it's about, oh, it's too expensive. And actually, it isn't. It doesn't have to be, because hosting and welcoming doesn't have to cost anything very much at all. And having these, like, signposts and, and a sign as you, as you come in to, I mean, uh, just staying at a hotel, I went up the stairs, there was no sign of just in which direction my room was in, or, or anything, so I'm wandering around and, you know, getting increasingly anxious, stuff like that. Just like signing, signposting. It's like these little things can make a massive difference to, to how people feel as they go there. And then what about the experience when they get there? You know, being greeted, good signage, knowing, you know, having things available and the information which is appropriate for you. And, you know, those kind of... Yeah, yeah. Absolutely valuable, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're sort of talking a bit, we've talked a bit from, you know, being outside, being outside organisations, maybe. Um, but I think, Aidan, you've got a bit more experience, I would say, of working within arts organisations to try and shift thinking, to try and get things changed. I mean, I will say that my, my experience is not within arts organisations, it's maybe within local authority um, more, but, you know, there might be something relevant there. I'm sure there is, but that, you know, how you can try and change a culture of an organisation and how, you know, welcoming an organisation is from inside and how that's going to be a bit different. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as a, as a 
it's a professional kind of, um, you have these key moments which you think, oh right, that's been a major thing in, in my life and, and I can think back to, to several, but the most recent one is, um, so Dash Arts, Disability Arts Shropshire has um, been running a programme, Future Curators programme, three disabled curators in three The Dash program is that it's not a major, it's about sustained systemic change over a long period, which requires a lot of investment from the organization. Curator, and it's about working in, um, well, definitely working in collaboration. So, I, you know, I, it was a great experience working in, I got to see what it's like working in an institution. And it's you know it's changed a lot of the way that I perhaps approach things and made me a lot more kind of politic and strategic. I still have that fire in my belly, but I, I might just say things a little bit differently now. And um, but also it's about like having those conversations about not just about how it can be accessible for me. And like I like now that I'm finished, that I think all right. So like now I can do the job. Now I can do the work, but I couldn't necessarily do the job because. The structure around those jobs and institutions are inaccessible to me. It's like how many, how much reasonable adjustment would somebody have to make in order to make it possible for me to do that job, which I'm perfectly capable of doing. But the structures, the nine to five, the when you can access, you know, where you work from, all of that kind of stuff. It's like we need to change these. And yes, there's ways of change, you know, doing your direct action, it was, you know, that was quite a subversive act, I think. But you know, we're both quite long in the tooth and we've both been on the on the demonstration front line. But also that's not always the way to change. Yeah. And sometimes by being inside and having conversations and showing good practice, yes. you can you can change that or challenging in an appropriate way. Sometimes it's okay to call people out on Twitter and sometimes <laughs> I guess I guess it's not. Yeah. And yeah. and also about yeah, it's not just what it's like the access for me as a, as a curator, but it's about the access for the audience, the you know, the people who work there, the other people who visit, who, who come in, you know, like tech people, just everybody who enters, because it exists in a community. Here exists in a community. How do we, and you know, disabled people are like at least 20% of the population. Yeah. yeah. I was interested in what you were saying about the curators program and the Reamer, because sometimes if you put a disabled person in a place, then the expectation on them that they're going to change something on their own is ridiculous, you know, it's, it's just ridiculously high that they can't achieve that. Of course they can't on their own. So it was quite good to hear that actually that's just part of a wider program that Reamer and the other arts organisations that are taking part in that programme are already engaged, you're already committed to being more inclusive. Um, and so hosting one of the disabled curators is just part of that. So it's not all the pressure isn't on that disabled curator to be the fount of all knowledge and be always the one who's challenging. And at the end of that year or however long the programme is that there'll be incredible changes will have happened there because of that one person that's just absolutely impossible isn't it well i think the risk is that you do that you do do when you're part of a minority or a marginalized group or intersectional your identity that you you are that you do a lot of emotional labor you're the go-to person because you're the disabled person you're the queer person you know you're the person of color and it's like actually that's not the, that is on my responsibility. It's yeah. like, you know, it's got to, oh, I don't know anything about that. It's like, well, we can read, we can ask questions, we can, you know, we can learn. It's like, you know, and it's it's an organizational institutional responsibility. Yeah. And part of that program was that they underwent training from Dash. So it's like it spread right across the organization. Yeah. And I didn't feel like it fell to me. But it was like, oh, I can introduce them to this person, and then that changes, and it become like um, introduced them to disability arts online about streaming, and now now that you know, it's like kind of built in, and it's about building in those networks and building in best practice and holding up your hands. You know, I I hear this 
well, you know, we didn't want to do anything because we were scared of getting it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so let's just not do anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which happens all the time, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I was interested in what you were saying that, you know, having done that program, you may be sometimes. Um, approach things a bit differently or express things a bit differently because I'm thinking, you know, sometimes I'm, I just worry that I'm, that in some of the projects that I've done now that they're just too tame, that they're not angry enough um, and that, because, that I'm trying to be too accommodating. Um, yeah, that they just don't quite pop the vibe that they did. And the reason for that, I'm, the reason why I'm pulling the punches, I think, is because, you know, I know people within the arts, I know people in various arts organisations, big and small, and there's loads of fantastic people who, would, you know, many of them, most of them, really trying to do the best and really do want to change things. Um, but that's, yeah, that sort of made me think, oh, I don't want to be too hard on them, but the other thing that's, that's also affecting me is a sort of general mood of, you know, anger and how quickly people can get into arguments, whether they're, you know, online and how entrenched people's opinions are about things. And I'm just wondering, you know, if we did do another demo about something, actually would that be counterproductive? Would it wind more people up than it can? So, I don't, you know, sometimes I think, oh, I need to be more angry, but how, how can I be, how can I be angry? This is, I've no answer to this, this is just what I'm thinking about myself in, you know, in the work that I do. Because most of that, well, all of that is definitely outside of organisations. But being angry is great. It's like, where do you direct that? And if you use your anger as a source of a drive and you do it appropriately, then, it, then it's great. You know, it's like working with, um, with climate change. My fear is that we say climate change, oh, it's so, you know, it's so bad and then we've got to do something about it. But then we paint the picture as so bad that then you're paralysed and you, you don't do anything and you, you're put into that kind of, you know, you, you're so afraid and you're so anxious that you just don't do anything. And I think, you know, the situation is quite bad and, and we do need to be angry and I think a lot of the gains that, that we made as a, um, you know, as a disabled movement, disability arts movement, has been lost. And I think, you know, we look at, I mean, honestly, I'm, <laughs> I'm tired of saying, you know, I'm tired of saying when I show my work in a and then, you know, I, I came up with this model of the, the disability trinity. So it's like, you know, we have a normative space with a normative curator, a normative art, and a normative space, and a disability curator, disabled curator, and a disability context, and a disabled building, you know, a dis accessible building. And you show work in this context, and it's like you're devalued as an artist, you're devalued as a person, you're devalued as a professional. And over here, you know, you've just got to look at like the amount of disabled artists who are um, in mainstream prime white cube galleries or any white space or any you know cultural institution as the main feature and it's like it's still okay down the corridor to the toilets but very rarely you know and then you know it's just yeah. like I, I before I went to Vima I put on an exhibition in, in London and it was like Every single one of those works and artists could have been in a white cube in a not, not you know, because the work was, it was, the work is critically robust, it's critically strong, it stands out as, as a, you know, as quality, whether you like it or not, it's irrelevant, but it's quality work. And it's like, why isn't it represented? Why are 20% of the people, we just not represented in like a number of people who work in culture, who are shown in culture, all of that kind, you know, it's just like, so when you say, oh, I don't know about being, I am. Yeah, yeah. You know, and things have got to change, but also it does, you know, we look at disabled people and either we are like Olympian heroes and so inspirational, how do you get out of bed every day? That's amazing. And, oh, you've got like a spare bedroom and you're, you're a total scrounger and, you know, disability hate crimes and all of yeah. that kind of stuff. The binary that we exist in, in a society. Sure. 
for sure. And I, I guess I'm not saying that I'm not angry, maybe I'm, I'm good, yeah. It's, it's about how you express that anger mm. and what you, you know, and how you get that anger to change something, you know, and how if, if that's, you know, yeah. How you make that injustice balance again. So it was that really. Um, yeah, I, I'm just going back to what you were saying about, you know, disabled, how many disabled artists are within mainstream galleries, exhibitions, you could call like huge spaces, whatever, how many are there? You know, something that gets leveled back. And me, I'm sure you've heard this is, well, how do you know? How do you know? Man, there are loads of disabled, there are loads of these artists might be disabled. We're not going to put a label on all of them saying this is a disabled artist, this is a disabled artist. And of course, that's not what we're asking for at all. And actually, yeah, it's true that there might be disabled artists on the campus of Grand East, if there's many, but there might be some disabled artists in mainstream settings, and actually, most people aren't aware that they're disabled artists, but some people will be. Some of those people will be disabled people who are visiting that gallery and seeing that work, and that will mean something to them. If those artists are given those opportunities, then and given more opportunities, then they have a bit of a platform as well. And some of those disabled artists are going to talk about being disabled artists. And so, you know, that sort of <laughs> ball rolls on. But also, I mean, you know, people like uh, Frida Kahlo, you know, completely appropriated by the mainstream. Yes. And, you know, when I'm thinking about, so occasionally I do this thing with the, with the Tate search engine, disability versus docs. And so I put in that disability is a search term and you come up with like 200 odd results. And then you put in any other term, whether it's seasonal or, you know, whatever, you know, frost or snow or whatever. And then you generally, it comes out with a whole load more terms. And it's like, you know, disabled, disabled arts are being written out of the, of the art canon, you know, and why not, you know, that is, you know, the most major, majorly funded institution. And it's yeah. like, why is it, why is it the more disabled references, yeah. disability references? You know, it, it's things like that. And I think about, um, I think about the pandemic and my experience in, during the pandemic and like everybody else, my work got cancelled. But then during the, uh, the preceding lockdowns, I got I got some work and I was on some panels and we were talking about stuff and like interested in people were interested in access and and you know and initially some of those meetings that I went to weren't subtitled even though like you know <laughs> they're freely available and they weren't signed and then. I was in one meeting and so well, why isn't it signed? And they're just like, where's the access? And I totally ignored it. And then enough people said, yes, where's the access? And then they had to stop it. And then they hold their hands up and say, yeah, you know, well, we haven't got any money for access. Well, why isn't it a budget line? Why is it not one of the first things on there rather than an afterthought, which yeah. is mostly what access is? Yes. Yeah. You know, and then we were talking about like build back better and being more inclusive and Black Lives Matters and you know, a whole range of intersectionalities and about better representation. And you know, it's like institutions have opened again, and it's, instead of that build back better, it's the same old shit. It's like we are less, or you know, we've gone back because we've gone back to being as inaccessible. Because I think you know those access tools have always been available, but it was driven by the normative, you know, people who are in charge, who have the power, who have the agency, sure. and it satisfied their needs at the time. And now it's like, oh, we can be back in the building. We don't need to do that anymore. Yeah. And then and it's like again, it's like taking the agency away from you know disabled people. Yeah. And then we have to beg, you know. Yes, uh, um, yeah. Well, I, I, I wonder where those good intentions then have gone to and why that is, and whether it's just pressures of reopening and, you know, an and, and onslaught of work. I wonder where, you know, those that you're saying, you know, that you experienced some, yeah, some good stuff during the pandemic, but that's all fallen by the wayside. So I'm just trying to understand 
why that might be. Well, right? we, well, we can be pragmatic and say, yes, everybody is busy. And you know, we've had the conversations about trying to fit an 18 months worth of program into three months of, you know, or, or before the next financial year. But that doesn't mean to say that we can forget about everything. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, institutional ableism is the same as institutional racism and sexism and homophobia and all of that. It's, you know, it shouldn't be accessible. It shouldn't be, you know, allowed. But it is. Yes. 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 Yeah. I mean, we, yeah, we set up um, Disrupt during the pandemic, actually, and that arose out of an online exhibition that was called Possible All Along, that was, you know, that was sort of referencing the games, some of the games in terms of making things more accessible that happened during the pandemic, that were suddenly, that we've been told for years before, were not possible, were too expensive, we can't take things online, we can't do it digitally or remotely, it's just too complicated. And then suddenly it turned out that it was, in fact, possible all along to do those things. And, you know, and I hope that that would continue once the pandemic abates. I don't know, but uh, on the back of that, then we set up Disrupt, which is a collective of Descent Dances in Leeds. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we're saying is that, you know, we're here and we're prepared to be a critical friend to arts organisations. Um, that we're here, we've got the expertise, use that expertise, yeah, let's see if that happens, maybe it's early days to know whether, you know, we'll be taken up on that. But I think that's a great approach, but, you know, there's also that kind of stay in your lameness or kind of, well, you know, where the institution and we, you know, about agency and power and who, where that, how do you negotiate that? Yeah. And I think, but I think a lot of it is about, like, having ongoing conversations. It's like, you know, I know that when I'm like an either an artist or a curator or work with an organization, <clears throat> the access conversation that I have is only ever the first access conversation that I have because it has to be an ongoing because you don't always know what's going to crop up. And you don't always know what the situation is going to be. Yes. yes. And I think, you know, we've got to, we've got to create this kind of atmosphere where it's safe to have those conversations, regardless whether you're an incoming artist or curator or, or you work. You know, why, I wouldn't. I look at like the um, the arts council reports and look at like some of the figures around disability in some organisations, and I wonder why haven't they got any disabled people? And I wonder, is it because it's not safe to say that you're disabled? Is there still a stigma about it? Yeah. Is there still, you know, what is that? And how can we have those, how can we have these conversations in an open, honest, yeah. non kind of, you know, kind of way? Yeah. And, and it, it, without, without that kind of friction and use it as a, as a learning point. And it's okay for organizations, I think, to get things wrong and to fail and to, as long as they're doing, as long as, ah, oh, right, yeah, we got that totally wrong because you can't get it right all the time. Yeah. And rather than like trying to like double down, just go, yeah, we got it wrong. How do we do it better? Can someone tell me? Because I don't know, I don't have all the answers. Yeah. I get it wrong, you know. And I guess that's what we're trying to do with Disrupt is have those conversations. That, um, as you said, you know, and yeah, and try and do that. I mean, apart from everything else, I just think there's, there's so many interesting conversations to have. You know, it's like, because we haven't had enough conversations about disability and access, because there's loads of interesting stuff to be said. There's loads, for sure, there's loads of interesting art out there, because there's a set of artists who we haven't heard from. We haven't been able to hear what they're view of the world is because you know they've been shut out of things um yeah i think it's i think i absolutely agree with you it's important that there are those conversations as well with individual artists um but what's also really important and, and i don't know if we're seeing enough of is that organizations have got strategies around this that they've got plans in place they've got strategies around improving access so yes for sure you have to be prepared to meet particular, maybe specific access needs of, of artists who you're working with, 
But also you need to have something bigger than that, some strategy that says this is how we're going to approach this over the next few years. And I don't know, if, if organisations do have those strategies, they're not being, they're not publicising them, they're not blowing their own trumpets about them. So we need more of that as well. Yeah, and I, I mean, one of the things that we haven't touched heavily on is care. <laughs> you know, and I think care is really, really important, and compassion, and gentleness, and, you know, having had other careers, it's like I can see how harsh, at times, the, the art world is, and I think, you know, yes, there's some really brilliant practice, but I think also there is some, like, really atrocious practice, whether that is about, um, you know, about pay and conditions or what, you know, whatever. But, and just the expectations about what we expect of people who, not just incoming artists, but also people who work within the organization. And I think, you know, we, we can think about access and equality and voices and agency and power and who has that, who has that. But I also, you know, if we get it right for one group of people, it's like if you're caring, or care about, or there's the care there for a, a certain percent part, part of the population, and it's a you know, say disabled people, then you might also make it more caring for uh, like a parent and child, or an older person, or, or people with like different, you know, who are di who have who are others in other ways. Yes. 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 And I think it's not just you know, if you make it better for one, you make it better for more. Yes. Yes. I mean, we've had a bit of debate about this this word care, and you know, and it kind of now so it's, it's not it's not how I would ever frame anything. It's a completely bit of a tricky word, but I think if we talk about you know, you can also talk about caring about rights and caring about justice, you know, and if we think about it in that way, like, that was something that yeah makes sense as well. Let's say yes, because you know the yeah the disabled people's movement and disabled people always said that you know. We don't, disabled people don't need care. We don't need care for what we want is rights, what we want is respect. Um, yeah, we don't want, because care can be a loaded word in some ways around, you know, we can move us more into thinking about charity and thinking about, you know, all these poor disabled people that grew up in Cornwall. We're not talking about that. We're talking about, you know, care about what's right. Yeah, yeah. So that is a, a good place to Time to stop. Brilliant, yeah, thank you both so much. And um, we're going to take a 10 minute break and then we will come back for some questions. So, um, yeah, be thinking of them. And if you're online, feel free to start listening in the chat. Thanks.
Thank you. Hi, welcome back. And thanks again so much to Anaya. We're in now, so I wondered if there were any questions. And if you say them yourself, I'll speak them into the microphone. And then hopefully you can answer as well. Were there any questions here? I I had a question which was kind of some sort of um, in the spirit of the not doing nothing but doing something in a positive way because you mentioned right at the beginning, Aidan, um, something around access and how it's become much more okay to ask for or to expect access as an artist or curator to be taken into account. I just wondered what the next shift might be. The next positive move might be that organisations and institutions could take in the spirit of doing something rather than doing nothing. Is there, is there something that you'd like to see as kind of the next the next shift? Great, thank you. So yes, I think the logistical question is basically is there um, you know, what would you like to see as the next positive step for change to happen? Where do you start? Yeah. Ideally, I'd like not to look, not to have to that for that not to be a question that everything is in place. But I think, like right from the start, we have to strip it right back. So even from the point of you know, uh, like thinking about job applications, uh, how do we put out the information there or proposals? How do we make how do we make how do we decrease the labour involved? How do we decrease the anxiety? How do we make those that information and that process as easy and as accessible as possible? You know, um, whether that's actually applying for a job or applying for a proposal, and yeah, let's look at Grantium, for example. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and how we build in these levels of difficulty in order to i think a lot of it is about gatekeeping so the easier that we make things the more um the more democratic we can we can make it and i think the more people can have uh, the opportunity to apply or to be part of something and i think that you know that those conversations now have to come from the institutions and be led from the you know and it's okay for a person to instigate those those conversations and ask. I know that I was the difficult person, and I know that I didn't work for a while because I was too difficult to work with because I asked for stuff and I challenged stuff. And the conversation, it, it was too, the conversations I was trying to have were too early. Whereas like now, you know, we have things like Access Docs for Artists, absolutely fantastic resource, you know, uh, but these should be in place and be encouraged by the organisations, you know, and and yeah, it's just the whole thing. Again, it goes back to hosting as well. So when you're on site and having, you know, having those visits or coming for the interview, just everything has to be thought about with care yeah. at, at the heart. And, you know, yeah, how can we make it open to the most number of people and to be equal? And I mean equal in parity in a, in a true, authentic sense. Yeah. Does that answer go some way? I mean, yes, because I was about a year and a thousand <laughs> thinking of it so practically. I just have this debate, you know, it is to work with more disabled artists. And of course, it's not just disabled artists, it's, it's artists of colour, it's queer artists um, as well. Um, but work with more disabled artists and employ more disabled people in the organisation. So you were talking a bit of a step back before that about applications and things like that, but that's just what needs to happen to change organisations. I mean, another very easy, I think, um, thing that organisations can think about if they're, you know, if they've got a public space is set up a quiet room, set up a quiet space. Yeah. But I, I think also, you know, for me, it's it's also about democratisation and it's about gatekeepers. It's about gatekeepers holding the doors open instead of keeping them shut and about holding the ladders down instead of lifting them up. But, you know, 
And I think about like knowledge, disabled people and people who are marginalized and othered tend to have barriers such as finance. They're not just barriered in terms of like opportunities, but they have less digital resources, they have less money, they have, you know, it's, it's, it's like an onion that you just keep peeling and it's more barriers after more barriers. And, and I think like, you know, there's a lot of organizations with a lot of kit that just sit idle most of the time, or a lot of the time. It's like, why don't we invite artists in to be able to use those computers, or use Adobe, or use, you know, the film editing, and or the cameras, and stuff like that. And, you know, we make it, we do, we democratize, not just like the buildings, but the resources and everything, and knowledge, and that's where, you know, I see a lot of this in like the Scandinavian countries where the libraries you can just like go and take, you know, use whatever you want in a, in a much more kind of freer way. And here it's like the doors are all are shut a lot of the time. And that shouldn't be. So, so, so when you think about like making things easier and getting access, it goes, we can't just like, oh, it's about this, or it's about that, it's about everything. Yeah. It's, about, it's about like reinventing the structure. I don't think like revolution is the answer, but it needs a big evolution and a, and a complete change of thought about what organizations are and what they mean and what they can give and provide. Yeah, and that's all organizations ought to be the best at doing that, actually. They ought to be leading the way, or you know. Yeah. Hi. Hi. This is a bit rude. You keep responding back to the question. For me, it's the biggest barrier that I face is about time. Yeah, I can just speak louder. And it's about the ableism of time. And so if I had to make a request of an organisation, I would say whatever the lead in time you've got, double it. Because it like as a disabled person, it's really hard to turn things around. There's a kind of hurry sickness in arts organisations where it's like, could you? Yeah. So I, I suppose I would just say a big request is ableism of time and having longer meetings because there's a hurry sickness in arts organisations that makes them ask for things yesterday, tomorrow, and if you're disabled, that is a real point of anxiety. That was just an opinion, not a question. I'm now going to just follow up with the question. And anger, thinking about who is allowed to be angry, and who is allowed to voice anger, and, and how we navigate anger to people that might be providing our wages. I'd be interested to hear more Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as, yeah, as well, I mean, I think, you know, disabled people get stereotyped as, you know, as, be, as, as being angry, as always complaining, as moaning, and so, be, you know, if you're aware of that, then it's like, how, how would you express that? Um, but definitely, yeah, yeah, how do you do that? I mean, the important thing is to gather with peers, find peers for support. So whether that's, you know, the artist union or a trade union, if that's appropriate, so that you've got some support, so that you're not on your own in expressing and voicing your anger. I think that's really important. Because, yeah, it is, it's really difficult if those are the people who are paying your wages. I even talked about that earlier, about, you know, how that worry in your early career that you weren't going to get or the work if, because you were too much trouble. So that was really difficult. So it's really important, I think, to find other people, to find your peers, to find people who can support you. My therapist would say, everybody's allowed to be angry. Um, but it's how you act, how you enact that anger. You know, we can think about like a, a, a toddler having a tantrum on the floor screaming fists feet you know or we can say okay i'm this i feel really angry i'm going to do this and it might be dear sir it has come to my attention you know and writing a letter or it might be something more direct but again i think that a lot of it is about how safe we feel and some of that is about the the amount of agency that we have as individuals 
and about how equal we feel and where that power dynamic lies. And then, what, you know, and there's always an issue when you're dealing with an institution, an organization, a funder, that they naturally have more power. And how they use the power is really, really important. They can like seed it and include you, or they can like lord it. And I think that's really, really important. And, and again, that goes back to care and compassion and equality and parity. And I think, you know, the, like the issue with, it goes with the issue of time and, and where does the power lie? You as an artist can say, okay, so I need this amount of time to do it. And it's like, okay, that's fine. But then, you know, but then when it's the organization that, that is like having, right, we need to buy tomorrow. You know, even though we've had these negotiations and we've, we've written it all, all down in the contracts and stuff like that. And it's, yeah. Do you have any more questions? Yeah, I was just interested in the Aidan talking about her experience in Scandinavia, but also her experience at DCA as an artist and as Nima as a curator. And if you had any really good examples of something that you thought was fantastic practice that really made a great difference that you would want to see rolled out elsewhere. Setting up a very quickly question. This the distance I think is something you could have said. Yeah, what examples of best practice do you come across that you can share with us? So I'll come to that in a minute. I'm instantly reminded of I did a residency in um, in a forensic psychiatry unit where I went with a colleague every single Wednesday for a year. Every single Wednesday, we'd knock on the door and then say, yes, and go, we've come to do, you know, and they go, oh, who are you? <laughs> and it's like, you know, every Wednesday for a whole year, and still, you know, and that, so that, is, that stands out as like really bad practice, lack of communication, terrible hosting, you know, where was like the buy-in, all of that kind of stuff. And I'm just reminded, so yeah, I had a really positive experience at Dundee Contemporary Arts back in 2011, which was my first major like residency. And it really, yeah, it, it was, it shifted every, an awful lot for me. Everybody knew why I was there, right across the building. And we had conversations about how, how can they make my time there the, the, the most fruitful, what do I need? I was, you know, I was introduced to everybody and we worked around like how I can make the most use of my time and take time off and not be too, you know, not because I have, I know that I do so much one day I need to have a, you know, it has a cost the next day or, or two days later and how can we build in these times and, you know, I as an artist have a responsibility to deliver. It, I don't, just because I have a disability doesn't, take away any responsibility that I have about delivering work and quality on time and budget, all of that. And I think, so yeah, that kind of institution-wide. And, and also when I went to, when I went to Mima, I hadn't even started and I was in the cafe and um, Laura Sillers walked past and she was with somebody. And, you know, I've been in lots of organisations where the head of the organisation would just walk past you and ignore you was actually she knew who I was and I would be coming there and then on a, and introduced me to the person who I was with. And I was like astounded at that, you know. And then the day that I arrived, it's like everybody knew that I was coming, they knew why I was there, there was like a team meeting, there was like, you know, it, it just, there was buy-in right across the organization. There was conversations about what you would, who you were doing, what with, and each, each part, each department, had, I had time with them, I was embedded, I could drop into conversations, it was like, you know, everybody was disturbable, and it's just like a really, you know, it was a really massively positive experience. And then, obviously, like, during that time, the pandemic occurred, but then it was like, how can we still make this really successful? And it was a, a constant, like, kind of, um, 
just a constant con conversations. I had a key person. I knew who to deal with. If they weren't available, I knew who, who I could go to. They knew me. It just, you know, it was, and I'm somebody who calls out bad practice pretty readily, and I don't gloss, and so, you know, I'm not kind of over it. It just really was a transformative experience that, you know, and also having an ongoing relationship with the institution and that, that change for them and me is, is sustainable and, you know, and now working towards like the next phase of bringing in three more, inst three more institutions and being part of that process and it's like rather than just being, see ya, you know, and it's like it's this kind of sustainable development of a, of a career that is, that is meaningful. It's not just like, all right, that's it. We tick the diversity box. We've done. We've done the disabled people. Who should we do next? And it's not like that. It's like it's really, you know, yeah. So it's like right through the organisation. And it's a positive experience, not just for me, but I think for for all those involved. Thank you. Hi, is there any question here? Yeah, I wonder if you tell us something about how your previous political activity informed your commitment to practice. Just to make that all circular, does your knowledge and experience of curation affect how you think political activity should take place? Okay. So I'll, just, I'll just repeat that so this will knowledge and experience of curation impact how you now think about the political. Yeah, I think it does, and I, yeah, so I'm, I'm, again, I'm sort of, this was a bit what I alluded to, I think, when I was talking about angry, being angry and how you express your anger, because I'm, I'm slightly worried that um, I'm totally bad down a bit by using the arts for <laughs> politics. Um, I don't know, I don't know. Um, Yes, it has. Uh, but yeah, I'm concerned as well that sometimes that curatorial activism, if I can call it that, is too much directed at the arts and cultural world and not enough, not enough reflecting. But I, I do do other things and I, I do try and raise wider issues that affect disabled people actually through some of the projects. But there's one or two where I think, oh, this is just getting a bit a bit internal, a bit about thinking about art and not about how that has a wider implication. So, yeah, if that sort of answers your question. I don't know, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I feel I'm getting a bit sidetracked. That's me, that won't be your answer. Anything near at all, I'm sure. I think for me, identifying as a disabled person is a political act and everything comes from that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, and it's important isn't it? because the arts and culture is, is just, you know, the major, you know, major way of expressing that and showing that. And that's, you know, why I do think it's important to be using the art to try and make political points and, yeah, and why it's important that disabled artists are recognised properly. That's why I do think that's important because you know this is this is representation and that's so valuable. important. But I think also you have to think about what you what you're foregrounding. Are you foregrounding the art? Are you foregrounding the political motives? Are you foregrounding the artists? And I think that within a political context has to be considered as well. And you know what you do and the story you tell and the story and what you tell it with changes oh. Oh. On, on those component parts mm -hmm. and also the impact that it can have and i guess ultimately what change or what what is the effect that you want to have with what you're doing and why so yeah we could spend all night discussing that yeah, yeah. i'll talk about the the action the impact. But yeah, that shifts, doesn't it, depending on the project, yeah. I mean, that shifts depending on the project and what you're trying to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. 
But also, I mean, it, it depends on, you know, when I think about climate change and people either, people make work which is kind of informative or to challenge or a call to action. And it, and it varies on what, what they want. And, and some people make kind of, you know, spectacle and, and they just want the big wow. Or some people, you know, want to kind of have some kind of emotional impact or to, to kind of, yeah, to act as a catalyst to something else, to engage whatever that engagement is. Thank you. Um, I think we've got time for one more question if there was one. No? Okay. Um, great. Well, so yeah, thank you all for joining us. Thanks again so much, Jill and Aiden and Anna. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you.